the Canon 5D Mark II in 2023. This camera is uh, kind of falling out of popularity, actually. Um, you know, I never script these videos, so I don't know exactly what I'm going to say until I say it. Just speaking off the top of my head, being as as honest and to the point as possible. Um, how do I feel about this camera? If if you're into cameras and history and things like that, you'll know that the cam the Canon 5D2 was a revolutionary camera. Uh, it not only did an insane amount for the camera world, but it seemed to do especially a lot for Canon in particular. Um, now my, my history I'm quoting here is mixed with actual facts as, as well as just anecdotal first point person point of view, you know, what I would, what my impressions are. So if I'm not exactly accurate, oh, well, still makes for a good story. Um, but it seems like Nikon was kind of the number one brand. They were always the top brand when it came to film cameras. And I said it in a different video. I think maybe it was my 5D classic review or maybe it was the, the Nikon D3S review. But in one of those videos, I remember specifically saying that when I was growing up, I didn't know anything about cameras. Um, my dad ended up starting his own photography business as a kind of a side hobby. And he was very into cameras and photography and he had all the lights and the studio stuff. But of course he was my dad. So I kind of wanted to avoid it. Um, you know, he's doing his thing. I'm going to do my thing as kids typically are. And I didn't know any of the brands. I didn't know what distinguished a professional camera from a hobbyist camera. I didn't even know the terms such as, you know, consumer versus prosumer versus professional or hobbyist. I didn't know those things. For some reason, though, Nikon's popularity and potentially, possibly their marketing was so good that me, as a just random kid from the Midwest, if I thought or I was trying to describe a real camera or a professional camera, for some reason, my go-to description was, you know, like a Nikon. And... As I learned more about cameras, as I later got interested in it, and I'm also, I love to read and research, and I like history, so those you go down rabbit holes with that stuff. Although there's always the crowd who swore by, in the film days, who swore by medium format. 35 millimeter was the small format, which was true to an extent. Um, 35 millimeter became really popular uh, for obvious reasons, potential, particularly because with photojournalism and things like that, it was just smaller and lighter weight and you could carry more photos and it was faster. It was just, it was more usable. Uh, it gave access to more things. So, and again, there are those photographers who would never shoot anything but Leica. But as far as which company seemed to be kind of the the top dog as far as popularity and sales went and how many of their cameras were in the hands of professionals, it always seemed to be Nikon um, as, as the most popular. And that really uh, came to be true in the days of the F mount, um, the old Nikon F mount, once they started making SLRs and they got away from their, their range finders. And it seemed like overall, although it pretty much became a race between Nikon and Canon. Nikon was still kind of the top dog. And if you wanted a professional camera and you didn't have any friends telling you what to buy and you didn't have any personal bias towards brands, you would probably end up buying an Nikon. And once you, we will, once we all switched into the, the eighties and nineties and autofocus became a thing, Nikon kind of did a solid again because Canon had the great idea, nothing wrong with the idea of changing their lens mount to the EF mount. Uh, it's a different F it's a different lens mount, sorry, a different lens mount and it will accommodate their new autofocus systems and all this stuff, which is very cool. Great. But it 
rubbed many people the wrong way. Because just like today, many people, many photographers who shot Canon or were maybe on the ropes weren't sure, weren't sure where they were going to go, they didn't want to invest in a whole new lens system. If you were heavily invested in your Canon glass, your, your old, I think it was the FD mount, if I'm remembering correctly, you didn't want to buy a new camera that cannot use all of your old lenses and you don't want to have to sell all of your old stuff at a loss and invest in this new stuff, especially when it was all, you know how people are, they're kind of stuck in their ways, right? A lot of these guys, although there were some who thought autofocus was this great thing, there were many of them who thought that's uh, consumer stuff, that's, that's, you don't need it, who cares about autofocus? So they felt a little burned by Canon, kind of leaving them behind, especially for something that shouldn't matter for a professional. Um, you know how it goes. You, you hear similar arguments today. And meanwhile, Nikon did everybody a solid, and they also started offering autofocus lenses, but they kept their F-mount. So they won over even more people. Um, whether it was people just choosing Nikon off the bat or switching over to Nikon because they could use all their legacy glass and also buy these awesome new autofocus lenses. Um, Nikon was kind of the way. And then as we got into the late 90s and early 2000s, the digital war world was, of course, kind of kooky and crazy like a Wild West. We saw crazy cameras, weird shapes, weird names, weird designs, a lot of really cool stuff. They were, depending on the exact year and how good the technology was or how much money the company had to put behind it, there were all sorts of companies trying to get into the digital world and trying different approaches to it. And that's kind of a whole different history by itself that's really cool to look at. But it was it was then Canon that started to eventually get the lead because Nikon, who, who for the most part, was doing things in-house, uh, which is a bit ironic, but you know how things went later. Um, Canon, early on, they started teaming up and collaborating with companies like Kodak. And there are several cameras that they collaborated with Kodak directly on, several camera designs particularly, or sensor designs in a Canon camera. But um, that idea of a big company that everybody knew that made cameras like Canon already had a big following teaming up with another kind of juggernaut company at the time, a classic beloved name like Kodak helped. And not only did it help marketing wise and interest wise, but the results were very good. Uh, Nikon photos uh, was, and then in the digital, early digital Nikon cameras were beautiful, nothing wrong with them. However, there seemed to be a little something special as far as the aesthetics, the pleasing look of the Canon photos, which were, were winning some people over. The other big thing that helped was that Canon, whereas Nikon was always seemed like they were always a little bit ahead or giving a little bit extra, always going the extra mile, always offering more megapixels, whatever it was in the early days of digital, Canon decided to pull out all the stops. And when Nikon had their biggest, most professional, top-end, professional like just flagship camera the uh the, you know those big brick looking ones um the the one one digit d series whether it was the original d1 or the d1h or x or d2 or all those variations um at that time nikon just had aps-c that was it they didn't have a full frame option and canon suddenly did have a full frame option before they had aps-c though a little smaller than Nikon's APS-C, but they also offered APS-H, which some people these days don't remember, they don't know much about it, but APS-H was kind of a, a halfway between APS-C and full frame, and that was a bigger sensor that let you use more of the available real estate of your lens, of the field of view. That was an attractive thing for people, and it did help sell a lot of cameras, but if that wasn't enough, as Canon already had APS-H and Nikon only had APS-C, then Canon suddenly came out with a full-frame camera. And I get there, this old one's mixed up so much, especially as I'm thinking of all these various historical cameras. But if I remember this correctly, I'm probably going to mess it up. Um, there was the Canon 1D, 
which was APSH, I believe, and then they had their 1DS, which was the full frame. And those early, uh, those early cameras were just revolutionary. It really, it kind of changed the game for Canon initially because suddenly they were the only viable option if you wanted a digital full frame camera and that won them a lot of sales and a lot of customers and that was when the tide officially started turning in canon's favor now then nikon struck back hard they came out with their d3 which as you probably remember if you saw my d3s video the d3 series the original d3 and then also the the later d3s which i had phenomenal cameras i can't say enough good things about them I'm not going to talk about it, actually, because I will rant. I love that camera so much. No bad things. And everybody else loved it, too. It was legendary for a reason. Fantastic camera. And it was a it was a big strike back at Canon. Uh, however, as they as they were now in a full-blown you know, war, Nikon offered a four-frame camera, so did Canon. Canon came out with, actually, this one. The 5D Classic, which I did a video on a couple of years ago. I'm actually going to do another one. This is my second 5D Classic. Um, as a side note, I have put a lot more time into this camera this past year or two, and I've grown to absolutely fall in love with it. So I'm going to do an updated 5D review video, this time with a lot of different lenses tested and uh, having it a lot longer. And it's really kind of changed my outlook, having had this camera for a longer period of time. Um, so that's a separate video, but this was the 5D classic, the 5D Mark I, and this, this was the next really big step in digital camera uh, evolution, because this was a big cam a big company that you could trust was going to be around for a while, were, were really thoroughly in the game, well established like Canon, they had a color science that people loved. They had a, a, a loyal customer base, and it was kind of a race between two companies at this point. People had who hadn't bought a camera yet were about to buy digital for the first time, whether it was a first-time camera owner or somebody changing over from film. They were primarily, in most cases, looking at either Nikon or Canon, and Canon suddenly offered this, which at the time Nikon didn't have an answer for, and it was the 5D Classic, which was a professional, and again, later, they kind of go back and they change the names. They say, well, it wasn't full professional. It was prosumer. That's it, semantics. For all intents and purposes, it was a professional camera. Um, they don't officially call it weather sealed, though some old web pages will, will say weather sealed, some don't. I think the, the hindsight being, although it's not officially weather sealed, it actually does remarkably well in bad weather. Um, I have not babied this one or my last one at all. I just throw them in bags. I'm I'm not as reckless as a guy like Casey Neistat, but more or less I view these as tools. I love them, but I use them. I don't baby them. And I've never, ever had any problem with the original 5D that I owned or this one. And the biggest thing was it wasn't this big, tall brick. You know, it wasn't, it didn't have the big extension. It did no longer had an APS-C or APS-H. It had full frame, but it had full frame, a big, huge, at that time, still a, a monumental feat, a full frame lens, or I'm sorry, a full frame sensor um, that could take full advantage of, of the field of view of your full frame lenses in a more or less normal, what we think of as normal sized camera body that was the same size as the old film cameras. And they hit it out of the park with the ergonomics. The ergonomics were great. As soon as you pick this thing up, the photos don't do justice. I, I said this in my last video about this camera when I reviewed it before. You look at the 5D in photos, and it, and for some reason it's underwhelming. People say it's got great build quality, but you look at the photos and you say, oh, it doesn't look particularly well built. But you hold it in your hand, and it's immediately evident. Like, they weren't joking. The, the legends are true. This thing is amazing. Phenomenally well built. Um, so it was it it was a small camera with a huge sensor, great ergonomics, the the button placement, the dials perfect, everything just clicks. Even now, like it's it's getting close to 20 years old. Not that old yet, but it's getting close to 20 years old, and everything just still is nice. Like it, I don't know if you can hear that, but it clicks. It, like everything is is still holding up so remarkably well. They built these things so remarkably well. Small camera, big sensor, 
great ergonomics, felt great in the hand, it had all these options. And the biggest thing was it wasn't just the big sensor, but the image quality was phenomenal. I use this honestly more than my 5B Mark II just because I really like the color science of this camera. So that was the big one. Now eventually Nikon came out with their other, they came out with the D700 and this snap, but here's the thing. Nikon now started falling behind because their answer to the 5D Classic was the D700. Again, monumental camera, legendary, did a lot. People to this day love it. I actually personally know a friend of mine who lives here in Taiwan. He's a he's an American. He's from, I believe, think Brooklyn. His name is Henry. He's a professional photographer who does it full time as for a living. He has been doing it for 15, 20 years. And he bought a D700 brand new to use professionally. He didn't buy a D3 or D3S. He bought a D700. And he has been using that camera on a daily for on a daily basis for however old it is now I can't remember if it came out in what 2009 10 11 somewhere in there but he's been using it all these years over a decade and it's who knows how many shots it has on it how many shutter actuations but it's still going strong people love those cameras but then that's when Canon changed the game and came out with this the 5D Mark II the thing that really revolutionized the camera industry um it's honestly it is it's not hyperbole to say it was canon that absolutely revolutionized the can the camera industry the entire industry the entire industry i can't stress enough i'll say it three times the entire industry changed because of this one camera the 5d mark ii had everything good that the 5D Classic had. They didn't take anything away. However, now you had an even larger screen. You had even more options. It had so many more functions and options for photography. You had higher ISO sensitivity. You nearly doubled the megapixels with around 20 or 21. I forget the exact number. Maybe it's 20.8. I can't remember. But nearly doubled the megapixels. You added weather sealing. You just, as you go through, and again, it would be a way too long of a list, but every single thing about this camera got better, which is hard for us to imagine these days because these days we have incremental updates. And it's amazing how often a company will just outright, they're not even hiding the fact that they're kind of screwing us over and they will actually take away features or take away functions on the newer version of a camera because they don't want to cannibalize sales of a more expensive line of cameras or because it's honestly they they think uh you know what maybe it's not worth it maybe we to keep the price lower we should do this whatever their reasoning is you can actually see the newer upgraded version of a camera have less functions and less features it'll take stuff away from it you've seen nikon do it you've seen olympus do it you've seen sony do it but that day the 5d2 came out it was something special the 5D2 improved, as for photography alone, no video, it improved every single feature. Every single thing on this camera got better. The screen, resolution is better. Brightness, it's brighter. Size, it's, it's larger. What about functions of the screen? Well, now we have live view. What about megapixels? More megapixels. What about shooting speed? Faster shooting speed. What about buffer? Buffer. Deeper buffer. What about um, buffering time? That's faster. What about card capacity? That's higher. What about build quality? Supposedly tougher. Again, I don't know for sure. I'm not going to torture test them, but supposedly tougher. And they added weather sealing. Every single thing got better. Everything. But that was the, that was just the start. That was the stuff that people forget about. They don't even talk about it anymore. As amazing as that is to have literally every single feature in the entire camera improve, suddenly nobody's talking about that because of the bomb that Canon dropped. Video. And again, it's maybe for younger guys or people who are, even if you're older but you're just getting into cameras and you weren't paying attention back then, maybe you don't appreciate what this did for video 
But not only did this suddenly offer video in an SLR, which I think Canon, or not Canon, but Nikon may have, I think they did it first with like the D, what was it, not the D, the, uh, oh, what was it? One of their APS-C cameras, but it wasn't very good video, so it's not worth talking about. This not only added video in an SLR, but they pulled out all the stops. They didn't cripple any features. They didn't stop anywhere. These days, you'll see video on a camera come out, and it'll be a brand new camera came out in 2023, and there's always, 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 always some type of thing where they screwed you over. And again, it's going to protect their the sales of their more expensive cameras, or it's they wanted to technically say something got better, but they didn't have the tech or the money to actually make it better, so they had to compromise somehow. New cameras, when they offer video, they'll say, oh, it now shoots 4K, but by the way, it's a, the bit rate kind of sucks, or the frame rate kind of sucks, or the record length kind of sucks, or the camera's going to overheat, or it's not a full sensor readout, or whatever it is, right? The, 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 the scan rate's really slow, so the jello and movement's terrible. Whatever it is, there's, there's always something. You know, you can't add a microphone. There's always something. This had none of that. This not only had this amazing, you know, full frame sensor, all that, but you had full 1080 video, not just 720. You had 1080p video, which again, at the time, not only do you have video in an SLR, it's full sensor width. It's full frame video. Do you have any idea how special that was? You had digital cinema cameras that did not have full frame sensors. This was started to be, started to be used by Hollywood Productions, which I did in another video. I talked about that. An insane amount. You would be astonished to know the literally hundreds of big budget Hollywood movies that were shot on this camera because not just it's affordable or it's smaller, which are all valid points, but it offered full frame, 35 millimeter video, full width, and in full HD 1080p. And not only that, but it didn't do these weird things that so many other cameras did back in the day when they offered video where, oh, it does this resolution, but, you know, asterisk, by the way, it's only 16 frames per second for whatever reason they come up with, or it's capped at 24. This would do 24, but it also did 30. I mean, it's it was astonishing. And not only that, but the video looked really, really good. One, the whole reason I bought this camera, because I'm going to be honest, this camera historically never interested me. I appreciated it, its place in history. Maybe you can tell my enthusiasm talking about it. Historically, I loved this camera. I loved what it represented. I loved what it offered to photographers and videographers. I loved what it did to the industry. I liked what it did for the industry. However, hindsight being 2020, you look back and you say, well, for pure photography, if you just want a very pure, simple photography experience, I prefer the 5D Classic. Whole separate reason, whole separate video. If you want technical, like upgraded specs, you know, you just want to do all these crazy things, we can buy a newer, modern, cheaper camera that has longer record times or it has a fully articulating screen, various little things like that. But this kind of fell in this middle space. If you're an amateur filmmaker, even today, it's still great. Gorgeous video. But I don't make many amateur films. I do every once in a while, but maybe once a year, and I don't show them to anybody. I always thought this would be kind of interesting to have, but I was never hunting it down specifically. I was never trying to get this camera. But I came across this for a good deal. It was around... With exchange rates, I think it came out to around 200 and. 20 or 230 US dollars when I bought it a, a year, year and a half ago. And for t essentially 200 bucks, I thought, you know what? I can, uh, at that time, like I have the extra money, I can afford it, I don't have to sell anything. I'm going to have this as an extra camera. I already have Canon lenses. I'm going to see how I like it. And I took some photos. I kind of skipped over those pretty quickly. And the first thing I did was really to, to pay attention and really look closely was the video. And I'm not exaggerating. Again, if you're a pixel peeper, you can you can technically say anything you want about why modern cameras have better text, 
or, or specs technically or they have better whatever higher resolution faster frame rates longer record times doesn't matter if you are into the looks the aesthetics of does something look pleasing is it nice to look at does it feel special does it give you that that feeling of importance when you watch it right i don't know what it is i i honestly don't know exactly what it is about the video footage that comes out of this but i like it way more than the photo uh the photo footage or the I guess not photo footage the the photography aspect when i take photos with my 5d classic they feel special. I like those photos. It makes me want to keep taking photos with my 5D Classic. When I take photos with my 5D Mark II, they're great. I actually, this was my main work camera. This started to be the camera. I'm in, in the construction and, and demolition industry. This started to be the camera that I always had in my work bag. And I always had a wide angle lens. Actually, this one right here, the uh, Tokina 12, not sorry, not <laughs> the Tokina 16 to 28 F2.8 Pro. This basically lived on, on the 5D2, and this was the camera that went to work with me every single day. And we, when we went to a new property or inside a new building that we had to demolish, um, whether it was for work purposes, like I needed to document stuff, this was the camera I used for all the work photos. And even if I just saw interesting things, be amazed at how many times we go to an old abandoned place, and there's just this kind of like urban exploration aspect to it. I just wanted to take personal photos because I see cool stuff. And this was the camera I always use. It's what I had with me. And I even took some videos at work with this. And they the photos are great. I have nothing bad to say about the photos. Many, many, many people, because this is a subjective thing, many people prefer the photos from the 5D Mark II over the 5D Classic. They like them better. But it's a big split. Half the people you talk to say these are legitimately better. Why does why does nobody appreciate the photo quality from the 5D2? And the other half, kind of like me, say, what are you talking about? The 5D Classic is special. It has a more beautiful, unique look to it. And they, they prefer the 5D Classic over the 5D Mark II all day long. Whether it's fortunate or unfortunate, I prefer the photos personally from the 5D Classic. But these are great. I don't see anything wrong with the photos out of the 5D2. They're still high resolution. You have an insane cropping ability. You can push and pull the files. You can install Magic Lantern and do all sorts of crazy stuff with like dual ISO and things like that. But the thing that that really makes me keep picking up this camera and keep coming back to it is the video aspect. Now, again, this appeals mainly, I think, these days to videographers. If you want to get into beautiful, and I, I use that word intentionally, I keep using it because that's what I mean, beautiful cinematic style footage, the 5D2 is a wonderful camera. Again, I don't know exactly what it is, I can't put my thumb on it, but something about the video footage coming out of this camera just looks cinematic, it looks special. And not just because you can do insanely shallow depth of field, which you can do, but there's just some quality to it. You look, you you watch the video footage, even if it's just like a test, like I do a little test shot around my office and change the focus around and looking back at it, there was just something special about it. I don't know what it is. Um, but I say videographer specifically because if you're just trying to run a YouTube channel or you're trying to do vlogs, this is going to frustrate you to, to the end of your days. Um... It's, by modern standards, not user-friendly. Now, for the time, it was insanely user-friendly. It was so much more simple than the more expensive professional options. But by modern standards, this screen does not flip around. The record limit is like 12 minutes, so it's not even 30. It's 12 minutes, which, again, for real cinematic stuff, for Hollywood movies, for amateur movies, you are rarely recording any single scene for longer than a few seconds. I don't know if you've ever paid attention to like cinematics or not, but uh, when it comes to cinematography and things like that, a lot of time goes into setting up the shot, getting the framing correct, working your lights, all this stuff. But then once it's time to actually record, any given scene, once it's edited down, very, very rarely lasts longer than just a few seconds. Even a really long, continuous scene, like an, an un... un uh, what do they call it? A... Uh, 
I can't remember the term for it, but basically a, a continuous scene that doesn't stop, right? They, they never switch camera angles. It's just one continuous scene. Very, very extraordinarily rare that it lasts longer than a few minutes. So even if that's the edited version, when it comes to raw footage that you need to have, like before they said action, after they said cut, you know, really setting up, I don't know if you ever have files that are more than five minutes. I mean, for professional video, you don't just turn it on and record and just see how long you can run it. Now, in the modern day of, of YouTube, that's super popular. Somebody wants to do like I'm doing. They want to be able to set up a camera and just talk to it continuously, maybe for sometimes an hour or two on end, and then cut it down to a 15, 20, 30-minute video, whatever. If it's, a, if it's an interview, maybe longer. And, but that's why I use my iPhone for it. That's what I'm recording with right now. iPhone will record forever. So no problem with that. With, with continuous recording, you use an iPhone, whatever. But if you want cinematic footage, you don't need 30-minute time limit, uh, record limit. You don't even need 20. You don't even need 10. A few seconds will do you. So for professional video, you'll never hit the 12-minute limit. You'll never notice it. You'll forget that it's there because you never run it that long. But it is there. So if you're a aspiring YouTuber and you talk for very long periods of time, like I obviously do, um, this ain't the camera to use. The other thing is that this, um, even though it goes into live view and it's a very good image on the screen, you can really tell what's in focus and what's not. It's, it's very usable. Once you're in live view, once that mirror locks up, you can't change any settings. You can't change the aperture on the lens unless it has a physical, like manual, actual like mechanically linked aperture dial. If it's electronically controlled, you can't change it. You can't change the focus point. Like you have to focus before you record, um, either manually. Well, manually you can change it anytime, I guess. But if I'm remembering this correctly, um, it's actually before the mirror is even locked up. You can't autofocus with the mirror up. So. You have to focus on whatever point it is. If it's an autofocus lens and you're using autofocus, with the mirror down, using the actual viewfinder, you lock your focus, and then you put the mirror up and you can record. So as far as trying to, even again, for a vlog, even if you don't care about the screen, if you're wanting to hold it out and record your face, you would need to memorize where things are at and not change the distance to your face. You'd have to have the mirror down, Use your autofocus acquisition with your, like your thumb here or something. And then once it's locked, don't move anything. Find your mirror up button, push it up, or get the mirror up, flip it up, and then hit your record. And then again, don't change the distance or you're going to fall out of focus if it's a shallow depth of field. It can be done. I did it just to see if it was doable, and it is. But it's not a user-friendly option. Um, so... You don't have super high resolution, though it is 1080, which everything looks good in 1080. No matter what what tech specs people try to push at you, everything looks good in 1080. Um, in fact, a lot of stuff looks good in 720 if it's high quality 720 video. Um, so everything looks good in 1080, uh, but it's, it's not super high res. It's not super high frame rates. If you want to do slow motion stuff, you can't do it with this camera. You cannot change your focus with autofocus lenses and things like that. You can't change your focus or any of your settings once you're in movie mode and you're recording. Can't change the stuff. You have a 12-minute record limit. Uh, however, all that being said, God, when you see the, the footage, when you see the quality of the video coming out, it's just so good. Um, it's beautiful. I, I can't describe it. And again, it's going to be different in every scene, whether it's a dark environment or there's lots of light with the subject matter is so much of what looks beautiful in a shot really comes down to what story you're telling. So it really, it depends on what you're pointing the camera at really. So if I were to try to show you an example by just pointing it at my desk and hit record and then stop, it wouldn't look really particularly special. But, uh, again, my opinion gorgeous video it's amazing it's really amazing um and you can use a mic so it, you can hook up a mic to this and and record internal audio um record audio internally like baked into the video you can do that 
which again, so many cameras, even these days, though they could do it, they choose not to, but this does it. It also means that um, even if you're not going to use that audio, if you were to hook up a shotgun mic to this just so you could kind of pick up the audio that's distant a little bit clearer, it makes it easier to sync with separate audio files later, which is what I typically did. This camera, I think in 2023, it's always going to be special. It, I mean, it's an old camera, right? Any, I don't like it when reviewers go to one extreme or the other. When I see a camera reviewer who cannot appreciate how special an old camera is, they cannot appreciate the qualities of an older camera simply because inevitably the tech specs are not as good as the tech specs on a newer camera. So they tell you all the reasons why it's no good these days. That drives me crazy, um, just on principle alone. I think they're looking at it through the wrong, the wrong lens. Uh, no pun intended. But uh, on the other hand, when there's somebody who is so in love with the concept of old stuff and nostalgia and buying retro stuff just for the sake of it, and they want to bash new things and act like, the whole industry has been turned on its head and it sucks now and modern cameras with better specs are terrible compared to this one. That's also not true. That's that's extreme in the other direction. Modern cameras are great. My big thing is I honestly believe, and it hasn't changed yet. I've felt this way for years and I still feel this way. Around 2010, and I say that year particularly for a reason, around 2010, cameras became basically like they're going to be good no matter what. Now, 2012 was, some for some reason, a pivotal year. You see the kind of cameras that came out in 2012, that year specifically, and basically, with very few exceptions, nearly any camera that came out was amazing, uh, even by today's standards. High resolution, very high quality sensors, dynamic range was starting to get really good, file quality was going through the roof, like, everything was good. They could all record video, like, everything was good. So there's nothing wrong, really, with any camera. If you cannot, and I, I mean this, if you buy nearly any camera from 2012 onward, again, with very few exceptions, some of them are a particularly cheap, low quality, they're not worth discussing, any moderately good quality camera from 2012 onward and you can't make it work for you, then the problem's with you. That's what it is. It's user error. Um, however, before 2012, as early as, again, depending on the camera, I'd say most of the time around 2009, but in some cases as early as 2007, but the safe bet is closer to 2009, that, that era, the top end flagship cameras, uh, single digit stuff. So whether it was the, the Canon 1D series, or it was the Nikon D3 and, and so on. Those flagship cameras, even by today's standards, are phenomenal. I promise you, you're not going to be disappointed. Again, you could do professional work with those cameras, no doubt. If you want to argue tech specs, sure. A can or a Nikon D3 is not going to have the same amazing performance as a D5 or a Z9, of course. But again, you legitimately can do professional work today with a D3. Um, at that point, the flagship cameras were kind of foolproof, and they were amazing even by today's standards. Technology does get better, but what changes is the industry. These days, you are paying a lot more money for cameras. In some cases, even when you adjust for inflation, you're still paying more. And it's so common that you're not getting as much. Again, this, the tech specs look amazing because that's just technology is cheaper these days. That's how things go. But when you consider how often you're buying a brand new camera and you're paying a particularly high price for it, yet they've they've crippled some aspects of the camera intentionally to protect their other camera sales, or they've actually taken away features from the previous iteration, or they, they there's always just something, right? It seems like you're always playing this weird balancing game with new cameras where Yes, they're all great, whatever. However, it's amazing how often you're paying big, serious money for a camera that cannot do all the stuff that it really should be able to do considering it's 2023. 
and how often, if you want a camera that can basically do all the things that it should be able to do, you're paying way too much for it. Way too much. So that's what's great about these old cameras is you get a camera like this and it is by today's standards still a professional quality camera. If if you were to buy a 5D Mark II today and you couldn't take good photos, I promise you it's user error. However, even though this is very usable as a potentially a professional camera today in 2023, I think it really does shine for amateur filmmakers. Even just out of the box working with Canon's original software and firmware and all that, um, it does such gorgeous, amaz amazing video. Um, again, it's very specific in what it does, but it's giving you high quality, amazing full frame uh, video. Which, on that note, well, I'll save it for a minute. <laughs> it, it is amazing video. It would look good on a big screen. And it actually has. Again, hundreds of Hollywood movies have been shot on these cameras, this exact camera, like the 5D Mark II. It will hold up to any professional test. So again, whether you're into photography or even video, there is no limit to what you can make this camera do if you are actually a professional, if you know what you're doing, if you understand its limitations and how to work within them. If a movie with a budget of tens or even hundreds of millions of dollars can use a 5D Mark II and make it do everything they need to do, then the truth is the guy... Even like in my case, the guy sitting in his office or in his house complaining that this camera sucks compared to new ones, it can't do anything, it's really not usable. How many people have said, this thing is not a viable option in 2023? It's not really something you should consider for video these days. It's kind of cringy. So that's that's my feeling. Um, if you want the simple choice use an iPhone. And I don't mean that as any disrespect. I'm using an iPhone right now because it's easy and it's simple. Everything shares to the cloud. You can share it easily. You upload it. I can transfer it to my Mac. No problem. You know, airdrop. It's easy to edit the files. I can do 4k or 1080. I can do high frame rates. I can do slow motion. Like can't like phones are amazing for video, especially YouTube stuff. So there's no shame in wanting the easy option, especially because the easy option has such good quality. Um, but there's nothing wrong with this video. It's phenomenally good. Now, the thing I was going to say was about the 5D Mark II is even after the 5D Mark III came out, that was another pivotal point in the history of cameras and what manufacturers later started doing, something I've been complaining about in this whole video so far, is that was it seemed to be the official start of what people have called Canon's cripple hammer or just of the camera industry in general learning the value of trying to protect their more expensive cameras by intentionally kind of crippling their cheaper cameras. Canon, unfortunately, also started that trend, it seems, because when the 5D Mark III came out, again, phenomenal camera. People still use it today. I have nothing bad to say about the 5D III. It's a phenomenally good camera. I love that camera. However, with video specifically, here's the thing. If you look at photo quality, from a photographer standpoint, the 5D Mark III was an improvement over the 5D Mark II in almost every way. Not every single area. Some things stayed the same, more or less. But in a lot of ways, it was better. Suddenly, you had dual card slots. Suddenly, you had improved autofocus. Suddenly, you had, uh, again, deeper buffers, faster this. It, it, it improved. It was great. But... This mysterious thing happened where when the 5D Mark III came out on paper, if you just looked at the quick specs, you would say it does even better video than the 5D Mark II because, again, it does faster frame rates. It does longer recording, up to 30 minutes. Wow, it's a better video camera. And people, so many people used it for video. However, Although it made it more user-friendly as far as uh, being able to focus with the mirror up and longer recording times and faster frame rates, the actual footage, just the video files themselves, didn't look quite as good. They looked good. 5D3 footage looks amazing. But 
mysteriously, it didn't look quite as good as the 5D2. And for a while, I wasn't sure why. It was actually hard for me to track down hard evidence on this rather than people just speculating. But after a lot of research and digging and looking at old old files and this and that, uh, it, it came down to a few things as far as things they tweaked, things they changed, the way that it read out information, things like that. But the easiest thing to point at that might be the biggest culprit and the easiest to explain was the bit rate. The 5D Mark III actually had a lower bit rate in video than the 5D Mark II. And again, because of the bit rate and as well as a few other little things that are harder for me to really grasp, honestly, and even more difficult to explain, if you look side by side, if you take a 5D Mark III and you take a 5D Mark II and you record the exact same thing side by side, you will notice that for some reason the 5D Mark II video footage looks a little bit better. Everything about it just is a little more appealing for whatever reason. But when you start kind of stress testing it, doing, let's say, low light shooting, I wish I could find the link. If I can find the old original video that I somehow found and I can get the link, I'll, I'll include it down in the description so you can see it for yourself. But I watched a video where a guy was testing all these different cameras in low light, not just the 5D2 and the 5D3, but multiple cameras. He was testing their low light and high ISO performance. And what caught my attention in particular was that in this low light circumstance where he was intentionally just increasing the ISO, it was a dark room and there was a single light source. I think it was like a candle or something. So that was not changing. But he was he was cranking the ISO up higher and higher so you could see how the, the visual image of the video changed. What was amazing was that as the ISO started getting kind of absurdly high, the 5D Mark III video footage started to kind of fall apart. It started to look very grainy. It started to have discoloration. It started to look bad, what we would call unusable. And the 5D Mark II footage looked great. Looked way better than the 5D Mark III footage, which I had to go back and keep looking like that. Maybe he labeled it wrong. Even when I looked at it myself, the 5D Mark II has better video footage. And again, lots of research, comparing timelines, checking files. My little theory, which again, nobody can confirm for sure, but my theory based on simple timelines and facts and paperwork is, I think, again, my numbers might be off a little bit, but maybe you'll get what I'm saying. I believe the 5D Mark III came out in 2012. I believe so. And you would say, well, if that was true, why would a camera like the 5D3 that came out in 2012, why would they intentionally kind of decrease the video quality? Again, better specs on paper, but it doesn't look as good. Why would they do that? Suddenly, for the first time ever, Canon decided to introduce, to launch, its cinema cameras, like the, the C100 and things like that. Canon now offered a cinema line of professional cinema cameras for cinematographers. Canon was already working on their cinema line for a while, especially after they saw the success of the 5D2. They saw how many people were buying this camera, who were non-photographers were buying this camera only for video. They didn't give they didn't give a crap about the, the photo quality. They didn't never used it for photos. Just hundreds and thousands and hundreds of thousands of people bought this camera just for the video. That's all they cared about. That's the only reason why they bought it. Canon saw a business opportunity and they immediately went to work on starting a line of cinema cameras. They saw an opportunity there. So then later in 2012, they released their 5D3 with improved video features. Again, faster frame rate and longer record times, and you can you can actually change focus with the video, with the mirror locked up, it's amazing. By the way, we've also started a cinema line of dedicated cinema cameras, and then that's where you started seeing all of their efforts for real serious video. That's where you started seeing the real upgrades in video performance, and that's how Canon did, right? Um, once Canon offered its cinema cameras, that's where their big improvements in video quality went. And if you wanted outright image quality improvement, if you were a 
Hollywood studio who had a whole bunch of 5D Mark IIs on hand, and then you looked at the 5D Mark III as an option, that was sometime used, but again, cinematographers, the their artists, people who make movies, they're not nerd, they're not nerds, they're not tech spec geeks, they don't care about that. They care about the art. They just want the tool that's gonna let them do the job and they care about the final product. How does it look? That's what I care. How does it look? And people who worked in the film industry saw the footage from the 5D3 and whether they knew why or not, whether they thought about bitrate, they don't care. All they knew was that for some reason, the video footage from their 5D3 didn't look as good as the video footage from their 5D Mark II. So if you want to buy Canon, if you want all of the user-friendly stuff and you want our, our color science and, hey, if you thought the 5D2 was great, well, now we have this new line of cameras just for you. Try a C100 or a C300, right? Um, but for the 5D3, that's when they started crippling things on purpose to keep it, to more so keep it in the in the consumer market. So all that is a way to say that um, 5D3s are great. If you're a photographer, I recommend the 5D3 over the 5D2. I personally recommend the 5D1 over the 5D Mark II. Again, I'm not telling you not to buy this camera. If you buy this camera for photography or if somebody gave it to you or if you're finding a good deal, absolutely buy it. I did, and I'm not disappointed. This is a great camera. It takes gorgeous photos, but preferentially, if it's sheer image quality you want, there's that something special, I like the 5D Classic better. If you're looking specifically at tech specs and, hey, what's going to be easier to use, what's going to have better low-light autofocus acquisition and things like that, and dual card slots, redundancy, then the 5D Mark III, right? If you don't care about specs, you just care about gorgeous, beautiful, artistic image quality in your photos, 5D Classic. If you care about things like better weather sealing and dual card slots so you don't lose your footage and better autofocus and stuff like that, 5D Mark III. Even, ironically, high ISO, 5D Mark III is better. But... If you don't have the money for an old cinema camera and you also don't want to learn how to dick with those things, but you want gorgeous, amazing, to this day, very hard to find, full frame, professional video quality, the 5D Mark II over the 5D3 all day long. It's uh, it's amazing. Beautiful image quality. So that was my very long winded review. If you've watched my camera reviews before, that's how I am. Sorry. I'll add timestamps so you can skip through here. But um, the the TLDR, if you didn't have time for all that, here's the thing. Along with many mistakes Nikon made, and I'm not anti-Nikon, I have two Nikon cameras right here, actually. My son's D5200 and my beloved Nikon D200, because that's CCD beauty, right? And my D3S is my favorite camera I've ever owned. I, I love Nikon cameras. I'm not bashing the company. However, as a company, they made a lot of mistakes in the past. And one of them was, one of the many mistakes was they started shipping or outsourcing a lot of their manufacturing to other countries, which if you don't care about, then ignore everything I'm saying. But some people do care about it for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it comes down to build quality. If you bought a Nikon D600, for example, which I owned, it had lower build quality and had a lot more quality control issues. And just overall, it was kind of a crappier camera than the Canon 6D, which by the way, is right here. I owned the D600 and I owned the 6D and I own both Nikon and Canon cameras as you can see. I don't choose one or the other. The beauty of buying old cameras is that you can just own both because they're cheap. I sold the D600 and I kept the 6D because that time it's, it's obviously head and shoulders above the D600 in every way, including build quality. Because even though this was their lightest full frame, lightest, cheapest full frame camera in the world at the time. Right here on the bottom, it says made in Japan, whereas Nikon's D600 was made in Thailand, I believe. And it just had quality control issues and was lower quality build and wasn't as ergonomically or, you know, as, as, as ergonomical or whatever. It just wasn't as good of a camera. That was where Canon always shined. Nikon started outsourcing its sensor manufacturing to Sony. Canon kept making its own sensors. 
Nikon started building more and more stuff in, in Thailand and in other places. Canon kept making their stuff in Japan, even their cheaper stuff, right? Nikon took a long time, even to this day. Some people would argue if they ever caught up. They, they kind of ignored high-quality video for a long time. Canon did not. Canon was revolutionary in the video industry, especially for t- cinematographers, right? Um, what can I say? This the, Again, the TLDR is... It's a fantastic camera. You have high resolution, pretty good low light performance. Again, if you're pixel peeping, we're not on the same page. If you know what you're doing and you know how to take photos, this has great low light performance. It has 20 megapixels. That's a lot of resolution, even for cropping. You can crop in so much and still have great usable photos that you could blow up to full size. Um, It has high quality cinematic, like full frame 1080 video. It, it has mic hookup. It has a big full-size screen, like a full-size modern style screen on the back that's that's big and bright and higher res and very usable. Everything's clicky and high quality. It has your light up buttons so you can see this everything in the dark. It has your top screen. It has a, a very high quality mode dial. It has a, a very usable, like actually the diopter on the viewfinder has a crazy amount of adjustment. Um, I think that no matter what your vision is, this diopter is going to work for you. Um, it's just just a great camera. It has a nice long battery life. I would turn this thing on and, and use it at work, take a few photos, maybe take a little bit of video and just throw it back in my bag and not think about it. I'd keep the battery in it. I never took it out. And I would keep doing that. I'd just take it out randomly and use it here and there, maybe once a week, twice a week. And I would have the same battery in there for a couple of months because I could take it out and go through and take photos, take multiple photos, stitch things as a panoramic, take some videos, do whatever. But because I was only doing that once or twice a week, I could have the same battery sitting in there for a couple months and not have to charge it. So great battery life, rugged, reliable, good weather ceiling. And again, the cherry on top is even by today's standards, it has gorgeous video. There is something special about the video that comes out of this camera. It just... It doesn't just look cinematic, it is cinematic. It was Hollywood's go-to choice for a long time in a lot of movies. Um, And they still use it sometimes, many people do. Phenomenal camera. And that doesn't even get into the options of Magic Lantern. If you're the type that likes to use Magic Lantern, this thing turns into a crazy powerhouse with, with Magic Lantern installed. So, 2023, it's a phenomenal camera. I... I couldn't recommend it enough. It's not perfect for everybody. I'm not going to say everybody should own one because you shouldn't. If you want just quick, fast, easy, effortless video, use your iPhone like I do. If you want the geekiest, most high-tech thing ever so you can just play with functions and features all day, buy something else. Um, But if you want something you can throw in a bag, you can take out in a rainstorm, you can basically use in any circumstance, in any environment, in any kind of light for photos or for video, no matter what, and it has good battery life and is not going to break, then this, this is a fantastic option, especially because this camera is a professional camera. It is top of the pile. This used to be the, the king of the mountain. Again, this turned the entire camera industry on its head. This is the probably most influential camera in the history of cameras as far as modern stuff goes. Um, It is the camera. It used to sell for thousands of dollars, but a lot of cameras sold for thousands of dollars. This was top dog, though. No other camera in the world could offered what this one offered and could do what this can could do. And in some ways, it's still special, again, for the reasons I listed. And you can buy them now for a couple hundred bucks. So... Great camera, phenomenal camera. I love it. I think if you've connected or with me or anything I've said, if anything I've said has resonated with you, then you're probably going to love it. And uh, I mean, that's it. I've talked enough. You're tired of listening. I get it. So until next time, bye.